We've had this weird little tradition to leave an extra meal on Christmas Eve in my family. Just a bowl filled with food for an unseen guest. It never had to contain anything specific. Just food. For as long as I remember, I can recall my mother filling an extra bowl with some sort of dish and placing it by the kitchen's window. Whenever I would ask about this bowl, my parents would tell me they're just thanking Santa for the presents he gifts us. Suffice to say, by the age of ten, I had figured out that my folks and other relatives were leaving the Christmas gifts under the tree. One thing struck me as odd, though, is that every year on the morning of Christmas, I'd find a birch branch laying by the window, next to an empty bowl. When I was thirteen, the sight of my mother placing an extra bowl next to the window sparked a memory. It was of a birch branch from the previous year that I had kept in our yard sparked my curiosity. And I've concocted a plan to catch whoever was eating that food and placing the birch during the night. Thus, right after the clock hit midnight that year at Christmas, I pretended to be tired and excused myself to bed. I just laid there in my bed for the longest time. For a few hours, I could only hear my family partying downstairs and the snowstorm outside. At some point, I was ready to give up and let sleep take over. But a sudden gut feeling told me to stay awake and wait some more. Eventually, the sounds of the party died down. Soon enough, I heard the door downstairs shut one last time. Shortly after that, I heard my parents making their way upstairs to their own bedroom. That's when I knew it was go time. Whoever was eating my mother's extra meal was going to show up soon, I reasoned. It just made sense to me that this so-called Santa Claus would show up after everyone's gone to bed. As uh, moments passed and nothing happened. Moments turned to minutes. And eventually, I am sure an hour or so had passed before I started dozing off. I'm unsure what time it was, but it was definitely late. So there I am, laying in my bed, finally falling asleep, forgetful of my disappointment of not finding out who gets that extra bit of food. Thump! A sudden booming sound echoed through the house. It was followed by the knocking sounds that had a rhythm to them, something akin to the sound of a heavy soldier's marching. I immediately shot up in my bed. Gotcha! I whispered quietly as I jumped out of my bed. Making my way towards the door, I halted once I reached it. Gloomy thoughts occupied my juvenile mind. What if it's a Christmas blackmail burglar robbing mum of her food? I thought for a moment. No, that's silly, Owen. It's probably just Dad pranking us all. I told myself. The idea of my father having an annual prank seemed rather plausible to my teenage self. My old man is quite a humorous fellow. I opened the door confidently and made my way to the stairs. Dad, is that you in the kitchen? I called from the top of the stairs quietly. As I stood there waiting for a response, I heard my father snore from my parents' bedroom. Ah, uh oh I whimpered under my breath as I saw a huge shadow make its way across the floor below. I waltzed back into my room as quietly as I could, hoping not to avert the attention of the intruder. In an act of stupid teenage bravado, I grabbed my baseball bat and made my way back out of my room. Quietly walking downstairs to the ground floor, I made my way as stealthily as I could. Looking for this intruder, I had my bat cocked in hand ready to strike. Mind you, now standing at six, seven, I was the size of some adults by the time I hit my teens. I wasn't exactly the smallest kid around. Ugh. I looked around for a few moments, and nothing. As I reached the kitchen entrance, I could see a large, dark figure standing by the kitchen window. I could clearly make out the crunching sounds its mouth made as it ate the pork ribs. I could hear the cracking of bones coming from next to the window. This thing was eating the literal ribs. I slowly made my way into the kitchen, 
trying to be as quiet as possible while adrenaline clouded my judgment. Everything seemed so slow and calm around me as I made each step closer and closer to the intruder. Hey! I yelled out before swinging the bat at nothing but air. Just as I swung at the shadowy figure, it dissipated into thin air. There was nothing, only the space between the window and myself. The bowl was gone. What? What, what the? Before I could react, I felt something slippery and slimy wrap itself around my leg. A millisecond later, I felt a throbbing pain coming from my nose. I could hear my bat rolling on the floor. As tears began pouring out of my eyes, I was tripped face first to the floor. As I rolled over to my back, clutching at my bloody nose, I noticed it. Standing over me was the silhouette of a massive, hairy beast. It must have been around seven feet in height, as its horns were almost touching the ceiling. The beast had hooves for feet, and a wrinkly, barely human face to it. Not to mention the fact that it looked to be as wide as two football players standing side by side. It had no clothes to speak of, besides what appeared to be a leathery overcoat draped over its form. There was some sack hanging over one of its shoulders. The monstrosity held a birch trunk in one of its hands, while the other was holding our bowl. Ooh, so John forgot to put his kid to bed. Hmm. The beast spoke in a hoarse voice, before disgustingly grabbing another rib with its enormously long tongue. I just lied there, paralyzed by fear and awe of that thing in front of me, unable to make a sound. You know, boy, it's impolite to swing baseball bats at guests, especially guests who had saved your father's life, the beast scolded me while chewing on the rib. I couldn't believe the things this thing was saying. There was no way in my mind for this thing to be possibly able to save my father. It looked like a man-eater rather than a lifesaver. I was too shocked to even come up with an answer, and so I just stayed there, on the floor, unmoving and fixated on the shape of this goat man. Noticing my inconvenience, it decided to place the bowl down the table beside us and then try to reach out to me with its hairy arm. Seeing this thing's attempt at making a contact, I wiggled farther away from it, whimpering in fear. The beast turned its neck sideways in bafflement as it watched me crawl backward awkwardly before saying, I am not going to hurt you. I, I, I don't believe you, I cried out, still clutching at my nose. Oh, come on, kiddo, the beast mocked. I saved your daddy once. You're lying! I darted at the beast. The beast pointed its finger in my direction and flexed it back down to his palm, and I found myself unwillingly getting back up to my feet. Before I could make a sound, I was face to face with the monster. Its long neck was stretched unnaturally to allow it to be awfully close to me. Is that so? The monster hissed at me. There was a sort of sincerity in his tone, or maybe it was just the thing's ability to manipulate our bodies like this that made me stop doubting him. I give favors, grant wishes if you will, the beast said as it elongated its neck even further. I know it's a dumb question to ask, even for a kid, but I asked anyway. Are you the devil? The beast twisted its neck in a way that its head was upside down in relation to mine, making me feel dizzy before it said, No. Well, you kind of look like the devil, and you do grant wishes like the devil, so you must be him, sir, I responded. The animal let out a throaty laugh at my remark, before settling down and saying, Ah, no, I am a... Never mind, actually. Your kind cannot pronounce my kind's name anyway. Your people called me many things throughout the ages. Be it Daimonos, Satyr or Fawn, Leishi, Aosi, Evelyn Folk. Do you know any of these? The thing questioned. I shook my head, being unfamiliar with the terms at the time. I've even been called Krampus, the beast proclaimed. I know that one. Are you Santa Claus's helper? I yelled out excitedly, without even noticing. 
You could say so. Old Nick couldn't quite perform miracles. I did all of that for him. Just like I ensured your parents are deeply asleep so we could have this conversation. The beast slowly said, twisting its own head into its natural position. Did you hurt mom and dad? I inquired, worried at the creature's latest remark. No, no, no. I gave them a good night's sleep so I could eat your mother's tasty goodies. The thing called out in an attempt to calm me down. Why does she even give you food? I questioned. Well, you see, when your parents were younger, your dad, he was very sick. Your mom prayed for help, and you never know who might answer those prayers. Luckily for your father, it was me, the generous Jerry Alobus. I fixed up your dad in return for something other than your mother's delicious food. What's that? I inquired with the utmost curiosity. I don't think I could tell you, my boy. You're a little too young for that. Oh, coming on. I've already seen you. What can be so much worse? I inquired. The beast once more elongated its neck for our eyes to meet again. The atmosphere in the room began to shift. It became heavier, much heavier. You could almost touch the tension in the air. I could feel the hairs on my body stand up as we were looking into each other's eyes. The beast broke eye contact and moved its head towards my ears. To whisper something in my ear. Something that made me shudder. Your father's hide. His what? I asked. Confused. Back then I still did not know that human skin was the same as an animal hide. The beast dropped its sack on the floor with a mighty noise before shoving one of its arms into it. He quickly pulled it out, holding something in it. Before I could notice, the beast's neck was wrapped around mine, sucking the air out of me while its hand was shoving something sweet down my throat. The monster let go of me as I swallowed the substance and collapsed to the floor with a sweet flavor in my mouth. Everything turned so dull around me. As I was losing consciousness, I could make out some sort of rift in the air. The beast walked into the rift while the stench of rot and iron filled the kitchen. One day, I'll take your father's skin, were the final hoarse words I heard before everything faded to black. When I woke the next morning, my nose wasn't broken. All my happy confidence that it was just a nightmare fled when I saw a birch branch on top of my blanket. My stomach knotted up when I remembered what the beast had said. Dad has leukemia. Apparently, it went into remission. And now, it's Christmas tide. I'm worried the monstrosity is after my father's skin right now. I can only pray I'm wrong. I am the modern-day Daedalus when it comes to aviation enthusiasm. I might not be the first man to fly a jetpack or a human-sized flight machine. That title probably goes to Eve Rossi. I am, however, pretty damn good at designing and building these flight machines. Being a former military pilot and an engineer, I've created a few dozen flight devices over the years. Now I say I am the modern-day Daedalus because my flying days are behind me, because of a very unfortunate accident one that has turned my world upside down, quite literally. Now, I am sure this accident would have happened one way or another. In fact, I think I'm guilty of the crime of filicide. Yeah, I think I killed my son. I did not physically murder him or anything like that. It was more of murder by negligence. I was a terrible father, I must admit. I was being too strict on him when he was a kid. I would implement my military mindset onto my civil life. I know I shouldn't have done it, but I did. I knew none better back then. It's not like I was making him march and salute me or anything of that sort. Instead, I was demanding too much from him. Top grades at school. Best behavior at home and in public. To keep himself in a peak, mental and physical condition. Not to cry over things children should be fine crying about not to be what I called intrusive, to be punctual, have the best manners, be the most respectful to his elders, and so on and so forth. I demanded perfection from my own kid. Hell, he made me the proudest father at any occasion, but I've neglected to let him know that, and for the love of Christ, I hate myself for that. I wish I could just bury myself alive. 
but as you can probably tell, my faith and self-discipline won't allow it. Little did I know I caused my boy to develop an inferiority complex, a bear. Now I don't know how much of a common knowledge it is, but the condition does not simply make one feel worthless and beneath those around him. This complex gives people a literal chip on their shoulder. People who suffer from inferiority complex force themselves to a standard of unhealthy perfectionism. My crime is never noticing how my John went down that path. I never noticed how he became a clean freak, overly pedantic and punctual. Maybe I've missed it because he wasn't exactly pathologically obsessive in his perfectionist tendencies. When my wife died from breast cancer, I sank into depression, but he wouldn't. I was in awe of what I thought was his strength. Now I know it wasn't strength. It was his weakness, or rather his aversion towards weakness. It must have been hell inside of that head of his. Admittedly, I sank into a slight borderline alcoholic phase for a time. But John, my dear John, he wouldn't relent from being the perfect son. And if I'm being perfectly honest, I was a dick when I got drunk. I would berate him and goad him into arguments. But he wouldn't falter for my drunken bullshit. Or so I thought. He was probably dying inside whenever I called him something, and was projecting my anger and pain of being unable to save my wife onto him. Gradually, however, I got better, in part thanks to my son who opted to drop his personal life to take care of me. Imagine that, being a kid in your late teens and choosing to help your shitty father over friends, a romantic partner, and good grades in college. I didn't deserve that kind of child. I deserved the kind that would shoot me in supposed self-defense over a petty screaming contest. They say the pen is mightier than the sword. Well, the spoken word has probably killed far more people than any gun. Take notes from any charismatic dictator. Tiki, have they ever stained with blood? probably, but not the oceans of blood they've convinced their followers to spill. Anyhow, gradually things improved, and we've moved on with our lives. We kept in touch throughout the years. I was never the super social kind. Instead, I stuck to a few military buddies and my family. I spent most of my time on my job and creating artificial second-hand bird wings. At some point, John showed interest in my hobby and we ended up working on these projects together during the weekends. By then he had already started his own family, and became a father in his own right. He was nothing like me. He wasn't pushing his kids, and he was always showing kindness. But then again, so was I with my grandchildren. I'll have you know this very important detail now. Yves Rossi might be the first, but he's definitely not the only man out there to fly a jet pack. It's somewhat widespread by now in the aerial enthusiast's community. I've built a jet pack for myself, and eventually one for John. We'd go on these small-time flights all the time. That was great. However, that was when I truly noticed just how much damage I imparted on my son's soul. He constantly tried to outdo me in these flights be it gaining greater height or greater speed. It steadily graduated to trying to flip the most times he could. That's when I told him I avoided performing flips, because after I tried a couple of consecutive ones back in my military career, I almost shat myself with fear. He laughed in my face, saying I'm probably lying just to get him to stop him from doing that himself. He rationalized himself by saying that all of my friends from the army always said, I'm the best pilot they know. Flipping your aircraft does not make you a good pilot, but he wouldn't take me seriously. That takes me to that dreaded day. Our biggest flight up to that point? Half an hour of free flying over the Arabian desert. I got us all the permits and paperwork done, along with a local rich sponsor who has a huge thing for flight. We went there and got everything set and took off early in the morning. 
We had reached about ten and a half thousand feet into the air before making our jump into the heavens. Moments before the jump, I held John close and told him to make me proud and to have the fun of his life. I fucking hate myself for doing that. He looked at me and said, I love you, Dad, and I will. There was our opening, and we both jumped. I was out first, and John followed a few seconds after me. We both stabilized our flight pretty quickly, and immediately I could see him pushing his jetpack to the limit. He was speeding away. I called him through the radio system, inbuilt in our helmets. John, slow down. You won't make it to thirty minutes of airtime like that. It's fine, Pops. I want to show you something, he said. My heart sank immediately. He was going to perform consecutive flips. I knew it. John, don't, he cut me off. I will make you proud, Pops. Promise. Jonathan, slow down. I tried to sound as composed as I could. He didn't respond. Son, I called out into my mouthpiece. I'm fine, Pops. Watch me fly, he retorted as he flipped himself in a perfect circling motion in the air. I couldn't look at him. He flipped a second time, then a third. Woo-hoo, Dad, look at me! I'm probably reaching your records now, I heard him call out. I forced myself to look at him. He was far higher than he should have been, and he was gaining more height. It looked as if he was trying to reach the sun itself. By the time I uttered another word, he had been in a vertical position. John Stowe. One wing on his jetpack snapped at an angle much to my shock. John! John! Pull the parachute! Fuck! I yelled out as I tried to fly closer to him. He was screaming all sorts of profanities as he was falling from the sky. The two seconds between his wing breaking and him pulling out his parachute felt like an eternity. My head felt dizzy and my heart was racing far more than it should have. I felt myself losing steadiness. I was shaking. His parachute finally came out, and much to my horror, it got tangled and wouldn't open properly. My son, my only son, he was falling towards his death at insane speeds. I had to do something. Dark thoughts clouded my better judgment, and I made my way towards him. I flung myself downwards to catch him and land us both in one piece. I know it's stupid but parental instinct is unbeatable. This, and I was being hubristic at the worst possible moment. Best pilot my ass. My boy, he was screaming the entire time he had been falling. These screams still haunt me to this day. Every night in my dreams, I see his mortified face as he falls to his death, his skin and flesh slowly melting away from his skull as his body speeds up towards the ground below. Every time I get lost in thought, I can hear him screaming for me. I wish the dreams were the worst part of it all. But as terrible as my dreams seem to appear, nothing can top the state in which I found him when I landed. I don't know what I was thinking. Not at that moment. Not my whole life. I wasn't thinking straight. I wasn't thinking like a father. I was flying towards him, my arm outstretched for him his screams driving me to the brink of sanity with fear and worry. An inch apart. We were an inch apart. I could feel his fingers on my arm. I love you, Dad. That's all I could hear then, before my ears went blank. My son was out of reach once more. This time, there was nothing I could do. His parachute wouldn't open. His flying apparatus broke. He was a living corpse at this point. Tears flowed down my cheeks, clouding my goggles. I wouldn't let go of my son. I couldn't. So, I flew down faster. I pushed the jetpack faster than I ever had. I was trying to grasp at him once again as the world around me faded into a morbid blur. He was too far away. Then he crashed onto the sand beneath us. I opened my parachute at a dangerously low point, and I was crying like a kid and lost all of my balance by that point. By some stroke of luck, or rather by the force of a curse, I landed eventually. My landing was terrible. 
I landed at a bad angle and the impact broke my back in three places. Collapsing to the floor, with pain shooting through my spine, sending a wildfire through my nervous system, I forced my way towards the body of my son. I tried to pull myself up, but I couldn't. My legs hurt too much, so I just crawled. I wish I hadn't. He was in pieces. The impact had contorted his limbs in an awful angle and spilled his viscera outside of his body. No blood pools or anything just a cracking of the skin and flight suit with guts poured outside. I could even notice bone shards. The force collapsed. His face was completely inwards as his brain was mostly out of his skull. I grabbed that mash that was left of his head between my hands. I didn't even care. It felt like rubber and gelatin in my hands. I held it tightly to my face. I kissed whatever I could, begging for forgiveness as medical staff and a worried staff crowded around my broken self and the remains of my son. Everything went cold and dark afterward. For the next three days, there was nothing but nightmares, nothing but hellish nightmares in which I found myself free-falling in a blood-red sky over a sea of white bone-like thorns and a black sun. In these dreams, a deformed angelic figure would appear at first. It looked exactly like the remains of Jonathan, its limbs bent at unnatural angles. No, its whole body was bent unnaturally, its guts floating about around it like tentacles, a caved skull surrounded by disgusting pieces of skull and brain matter. It also had featherless, misshapen, gigantic wings sticking out of its back. It started as one, and then it multiplied until it became a legion of these things. They were all screaming at me that everything was my fault. They were screaming at me I was the reason they were what they were. I was the reason they were in so much pain. Their voices, inhuman, guttural and awful deep. If you could translate a mix of anger and pain into sound... These voices were what it would sound like. Each dream would end with these things smothering me with their physical forms, before dragging me down to the ground, sending lightning bolts through my spine. Each dream would end the same, and at each dream's end, then I would black out, only to find myself free-falling once more in this horrid dreamscape. After three days of this endless torture cycle, when I finally came to my senses fully, I found out I wasn't really dreaming that. I hallucinated that. I would endlessly whimper and scream whenever I was awake. Even worse, it wasn't even the medications they gave me, but I received nothing that could cause hallucinations. I was in so much pain, my brain was losing its shit on itself. The road to physical recovery was akin to speeding on a highway full quite a literal agony, with your legs serving as your car's wheels. The worst toothache has nothing on your spine trying to murder, break your psyche unwillingly with endless pain signals. My back doesn't hurt much anymore, however I wish it had. This way, I wouldn't have the time to self-torment over the fact I've killed my own flesh and blood. The worst part is, no one seems to even think so. No matter how much I tell them the full story of how I've been killing my son throughout his whole life. Every day, I tell myself that I am going to stop drinking. Yet every day I find myself picking up the glass once more. It's a good thing I don't drink that much daily. I know liver will probably fall apart by the time I reach my sixties, but I have yet to come across a better way to calm the storm that has been raging in my mind ever since I met him. Back in 2013, I requested my leave from the Syrian observation mission. At that point, I had grown tired from seeing all the pointless bloodshed that was going on there. I had been a soldier pretty much my whole adult life up to that point, and being so powerless was probably just a tad too much for me. Once I was granted my release, I had decided to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. 
It was a lovely trip, all in all. One evening I've decided to clear my head at a local bar. I was sitting there, completely zoned out as some silly club music blared through the speakers. My head was in the clouds. That is, until a gruff voice snapped me back into reality. What does a United Nations soldier do in such a place? My mind snapped back into fight mode as my head snapped sharply to my left. A bearded man was sitting next to me. He was visibly a few inches taller than me, and his smug expression made me a little uneasy. Not to mention the fact that he was not supposed to know my profession, or so I thought back then. How? I was cut off short. How do you know you'd like to ask? He retorted, as a wide smile formed on his face. A knot began forming inside my stomach. I almost felt sick with the build-up of dread. I began clenching my fists. A million thoughts whirled in my mind. I could not fathom at the time the existence of this person. The Lord of Flies knows many a thing, he chuckled at me, further adding to my nervousness. I was about to explode at him and demand answers in regard to his strange behavior and impossible knowledge. Bis. However, the man reached into the pocket of his coat and pulled out some old coin. He proceeded to toss it into the air as my eyes followed every single movement of his. As the coin spun through the air, it started slowing down mid-flight and everything around me. The music stopped playing, the lights above had stopped moving and the coin froze in the air. The sight made my heart sink. My fear was probably evident, as the man was trying hard not to burst into laughter. None of this made any sense to me back then, and all I could muster was a soft, unconfident, what? Time stood still around me. Quite literally. Everything was simply frozen in time. I didn't know how to react. I didn't know what to think. I could move as the whole situation was too hard to process. The man reached out his hand to me offering a handshake. Beelzebul, my pleasure, Daniel. Wo Ch I couldn't speak. I felt sick. This was too much for me to handle and I threw up on the floor. My head was spinning and my heart raced. I felt awful. There was no mistaking it. I was approached by some sort of something supernatural. Otherwise, he wouldn't be able to know my name. I wiped my face and looked at the man whom I assumed was the devil at that point. He had lowered his arm and took a sip of his beer. I know, it's quite shocking, all of this. It's not my first rodeo with you humans. Not wanting to piss off someone who could stop time and probably knew about me more than I wanted anyone to. I cautiously asked him, Are you the devil? The man burst out into a maddening laughter, which had somewhat put me at ease. Oh, father, this joke again, he mused to himself as some beer had spilled on his coat, clearly amused by lack of awareness towards higher beings such as himself. No, no, I am not the devil. It's a common misconception. However, he proceeded to note. You see, angels, demons, whatever, we are all the same kind. There was no big fight or even a divide between us. There is not much of a hierarchy or rule set between us. We are truly equal to one another. Everything you know about us is a human fiction. He continued speaking. Every time Father tried speaking to you humans, you go mad. I guess you're still not a high enough level to communicate with the old man. This made very little sense to me, as it was the opposite from what I was taught my whole life. I wasn't sure if I should believe this person or not. After all, he was claiming to be a demon. I guess he had noticed the doubt written all over my face as he made a snarky remark towards me. If I was lying, wouldn't I be tempting you with something right now? You know the prince of gluttony, yada yada. No, I just... Yeah, I get it, Daniel. You've been indoctrinated to believe in some weird anthropocentric story. Mind you, that there are millions, perhaps even billions of species, who are even more intelligent than your kind. To be honest, I'm pretty certain there are beings who are more advanced than my father, 
somewhere out there. There are probably beings higher than God. I had nothing to say. I was completely shocked by this revelation. While on the one hand, the things he was saying were making sense, on the other hand, they weren't making any sense at all. So how does this whole cosmic order thing work then? I asked weakly. Hmm. Well, anything with a consciousness mechanism has what you define as a soul. It includes me, you, everything else on this planet with a complex neural system. Even Father has that sort of thing. Now nothing is really eternal. Eventually everything dies. At one point, every sentient being will pass away. He answered, Even God? I was unsure if I even wanted to hear the answer to that question, and yet I asked anyway. Yeah. Someday, in the future, you are aware of the fact that he isn't all creator of everything. As obvious as this should have been at that point, this sentence sent chills down my spine. I sank deeper into my chair. Hmm, here's the kicker. Though there's one thing you humans got right, in a way hell is real. The circumstances around it are what you got wrong. What do you mean, don't the wicked go there? I asked him in response. No, not the wicked, but the guilty, he proclaimed as he hoisted his cup of beer into the air. The guilty? I asked, puzzled. Yeah, if you die feeling guilt over something, it turns into a negative energy, and your consciousness goes to this dimension where it has to rid itself of said guilt. It has to be a major thing. However, if you feel guilty for something extremely minor, you are most likely to just dissipate into the universe. Once he had finished speaking about the inner workings of the universe, I looked directly into his green eyes and asked, with as much confidence as I could muster, So, why are you telling me all of this? He smiled that unsettling smile once again. It's because I need your opinion on something, Daniel. Let's have a walk, shall we? He got up from his chair and began walking towards the entrance of the bar. At first, I was hesitant to do anything, and I watched him walk for a few moments before I heard him call out to me. Not wanting to piss off a thing that could stop time and probably murder me on a whim, I got up to my feet, ignoring the dried puke on my shoes, and started catching up with the man. Once I reached him, he was at the bar's entrance, pressing his hand against the door. As the door swung open, a bright light engulfed me, blinding me for a moment. It felt as if a flash grenade was thrown straight at me. The light was so bright it almost hurt. After an agonizing few seconds, the light began dispersing, and a familiar sight greeted my eyes. No way, I blurted under my breath. We are in Syria, next to some rebel encampment, Beelzebul announced almost gleefully. I looked around, and the bar building was right behind me, however. It was surrounded by the nearly endless sands of the Syrian desert. I was in this place before. There was no mistaking it. This was the Syrian desert. As I was trying to process whatever was going on around me, Beelzebul asked me, Tell me, Daniel, do you believe that all humans deserve to live? He caught me off guard, but this was probably the easiest answer I had to give that day. Yes, I do, I answered, still eyeing my surroundings. Even the sadistic band of serial murder rapists in this encampment before us? He asked again, pointing at the makeshift paramilitary compound. Yes, even them. If what you say about them is true, they should be detained and tried, but they do deserve to live. Killing them won't make it any better. It was still an easy question. I don't believe killing will ever salvage anything. I doubt the death penalty is a good way to rid ourselves of crime even to this day. I see. Well, follow me. I need to show you something that might change your mind. Beelzebub began walking towards the bar building once more pushing the door open again. I stumbled across the sands after him. The alcohol I had consumed earlier was starting to take effect again. 
A bright light blinded me again, followed by a freezing breeze that sent chills throughout my whole body. Once I had regained my sight, I found myself standing at the beginning of a large stone bridge above a deep, dark pit. The longer I stared down, the more I came to realize that I could not see the bottom of this hole. The dread started eating at me once more when another gust of freezing wind hit my body. Soon after I began hearing screaming coming from up above me, I turned my head upwards ever so slightly to see a human body, a naked human body, falling towards me from up above. This body was alive, I could tell so, as it was flailing its limbs about. The body's screams growing louder with each passing moment. When the body was mere inches from me, I saw its face. Oh God, its face. The despair was permanently etched onto its features. There was a fearful stare in its glaring eyes. The cheeks muscles were stretched beyond what I thought was possible due to the constant screaming. Drool and tears flew all over. I know that we shared eye contact for the briefest of moments, but I've never seen someone in so much pain before. Is this H? I mumbled as the body flew past me into the seemingly never-ending darkness below. Yes, Beelzebul noted, with a smile stretching from ear to ear. He seemed to be almost glowing in that God-forsaken place. Long after the body flew past me, I could hear its constant screaming. It kept on ringing in my ears for a long time after I had left that cursed abyss. Beelzebul lead me on atop the stone bridge for quite some time, and the longer I walked on this bridge, the more I wanted out of there. These bodies, they kept on falling. All over. Oh, God. Some hit the bridge. Massive bloodstains. They kept on falling. They just slipped downwards back into the bottomless moor of their Abaddon. I'm so sorry. I just... It's hard bringing this up again in detail, even though it never leaves me, even though it haunts me in my dreams. After some walking, Beelzebul stopped me and asked me to look down to my left. When I looked, I saw a piece of rock protruding from the darkness itself. On top of the rock there was a sea of people walking one after another in circles. In an unbreakable harmony, they march forever, one after the other. Each step seemed more fatigue than the last one. Beelzebul told me that those were the people who've died harboring the guilt of following a bad leader. These were Nazi soldiers, terrorists, mob soldiers, all sorts of weak-minded individuals who knew they were following the wrong leader and still went on with it. Beelzebul even called them pathetic for harboring such a guilt noting that these were his least favorite kind of hell spawns. I felt bad for them. I do understand their guilt. The reasons I left my active service in Syria, because of my powerlessness, brought upon me by a set of regulations that do not strive to prevent as much suffering as possible. I hated that feeling. I hated feeling powerless. And yet look at me now. I am powerless more than ever before. We kept on walking across the stone bridge for some more time, before a rancid stench filled my nostrils. Beelzebul told me to look to my right. There was another protrusion made of stone peeking through the darkness. On top of the protrusion, there was a pile of a dark substance made of what smelled like feces. I had a hard time looking at that direction, as the stench was way too vile for me. Beelzebul, on the other hand, was enjoying the view of a human pull himself out of the pile, only to be sunk back down into it by another human's arms, as the latter tried to pull himself out as well, only to suffer the same fate at the hands of another. Can we leave? It stinks too bad, I cried out from underneath my shirt-covered mouth. Beelzebul just grunted in approval and led me on across the bridge of stone. Soon enough we were standing at the edge of a forked path, 
One diversion was made up of stone, another of some pulsating fleshy mass, and another was made up of sand. Beelzebul led me on the path of sand. I'd like you to meet someone, Daniel, someone very important. He's been here for nearly two millennia, Beelzebul remarked with some glee in his tone. Two thousand years, I muttered. I couldn't even bear staying another hour in this place, and yet someone was there for two thousand years. Beelzebul did not speak for a while as we walked on the sandy path. I grew more and more anxious with each moment, to the point of trembling. My mind was racing, my breathing was quick and shallow. I'm sorry, I can't. I need a moment to relax. I can't type. Properly. Eventually, we reached a large sand dune. It was the biggest sand dune I have ever seen. It was so massive it towered everything else in sight. A literal sand giant in the middle of a world made out of pure darkness. I'd like you to meet Gaius Julius Caesar Augustus Germanicus, announced Beelzebul in a gleeful tone. A young, tall and skinny man, dressed in a bloodied tunic, strutted out of the sand dune. He had a very fixated cold stare in his eyes. It's like he was bulging his pupils out at us. The man just stared for a minute or so. The surrounding atmosphere was so tense you could cut it in half. He shrieked like a wounded animal and fell onto the sand, screaming obscenities at the old Roman deities and the Senate. He then began shrieking about how he should be the god of this world, the god of all worlds, from the Capitoline Hill down to the depths of Tartaros. He began rolling around in the sand, screaming at the top of his lungs that he is the emperor god of all and that he should have had made them fear him more. He then proceeded to shove sand down his own throat, first with his hands, and then he just fell onto the ground first and started swallowing the sand beneath him with his mouth. He wouldn't stop that for a while, not even when it was clear that he was choking on the sand, Mount or not. I swear I could see some sand pouring down from his nasal cavity. The man was a complete wreck. At some point, his stomach could not contain any more of the substance, and he threw it all out, producing vile choking sounds as he did. He then started rolling in his own vomit, shrieking about fear and control, and no matter for how long he rolled in the sand, he kept his stare fixated on me. There was something really unnerving about his almost fish-like hazel eyes being locked on me. He began screaming obscenities again as he ran onto the top of the dune while I watched in pity as he hurled himself down its sands. His body rolled around in the sand like a rag doll tossed about. I could hear the sickening cracking sounds of his bones echo throughout the space as his body was being folded in unnatural angles by his own momentum. Eventually his broken body landed at my feet, the body laid there as his limbs were folded awkwardly. His body was positioned on its belly, with the head turned in a hundred and eighty degrees. His goddamned fish eyes were staring straight at me. I felt a knot build up in my stomach again. I was sure I would throw up again. I could literally feel the food rising up my esophagus. Bow to your god, the body whispered. It startled me. A moment later, I found myself sitting back at the bar, next to Beelzebul, shaking with fear as my mind was racing. Nothing made any sense to me any more at all. I looked at Beelzebul, and the back of my head began throbbing as I was hit with a hammer across the head. My vision started blurring, and my ears began ringing. I... I... I don't... I managed to blurt out as I was trying to fight through my sudden headache. So, did your meeting with Little Sandals make you change your mind about the value of all human lives? Beelzebul asked. I don't. And no. I forced myself to respond weakly as my head felt as if it was about to blow up. Beelzebul drunk up all of his remaining beer and said, well, that's a shame because I already slaughtered that whole Syrian encampment. As he said that, 
The pain in my head began subsiding, and disturbing images began popping up in my mind. I've seen it. I've seen it all. The way he tore them apart. The way he ripped them to shreds. I felt the tears. I felt the tears streaming down my cheeks just like they do now. As I write this, I can't get the image of him making a gun sign with his fingers, shoving it down a kneeling man's mouth and blowing up his skull. Oh, God. Beelzebul was gone after that. I heard that damned coin fall onto the wood. I placed my head on my arms and began crying. I couldn't stop. I can't. I can't. He was gone. But the guilt. It's there. It's all my fault. All of this is my fault. It's my fault I followed him there. Everything is my fault. Please pardon me. I'm just a sorrowful drunk with a lot on his plate. I know now that the devil does not bargain for souls. He simply guilts their owners straight to hell, where he can watch them suffer for as long as he wants them to. I'll drink to the craftiness of this son of a gun. Cheers.